Monday, August 28th. Today was the first day of school. I left the house at 7.30 to walk to the front of the development and catch the bus. The smoke was thick and strong smelling. I walked past dark green dumpsters filled with plasterboard and scrap metal, past blue portable toilets parked along the construction lots. It occurred to me that I've never lived in a development that was finished. I've always lived with overflowing construction dumpsters and portable toilets sitting on boards. I turned right at the end of Kensington Gardens Drive and walked parallel to the high gray wall. Something started to bother me almost immediately. The gray of the wall drifted along in the left side of my vision, distracting me, troubling me. What was it? Something about the wall? Something about a bus stop? Something that I needed to remember? My steps slowed down and I came to a dead stop, frozen there like a wind-up toy that had run out of torque. Then a scene came back to me, just like the other morning in Houston, entirely on its own. A scene came back to me. I remembered another bus stop in a shiny yellow school bus. I was standing at the back of a line of kids waiting to board the bus for one of my first days at kindergarten. Mom had driven me to school on the actual first day. This was the first day when I would be accompanied by no one except Eric, my fifth grade brother. But Eric did not accompany me for long. He was standing at the front of the school bus line with his fifth grade friends. When one of them turned, made a gesture and called me, Hey, Eclipse boy, how many fingers am I holding up? I didn't realize at first that the boy was talking to me and I had no idea what he meant. Eric and his friends laughed about the joke. Then the bus doors opened and we all filed in. I can't put all of the details in order now, but it became clear to me later for some reason, the big go kids on the school bus were calling me Eclipse Boy. The fact is, we did have an eclipse that summer, around three weeks before school started. Based on that, Eric was telling his friends his story. The reason for the Coke bottle glasses on my eyes was that I had stared at the sun unprotected during that eclipse. The story puzzled me then, and it puzzles me now. I do not remember doing any such thing, and I yell... And yet, when I search through our family photos, I can see that I never wore glasses of any kind before that summer. But right after the eclipse, I was wearing these th thick lenses that I now call my regular glasses. Puzzled or not, I went right along with the story, I even told it myself. I, it gave me a special kindergarten identity. It made me somebody. I was the boy who had not listened and who was now playing, paying the price. Look at me if you dare. Teachers and other adults seemed to value me as an example. I was a living proof that you shouldn't look at an eclipse or you'll go blind. And you shouldn't pay, play in an abandoned refrigerator or you'll suffocate. That you shouldn't go swimming right after you eat or you'll get stomach cramps and drown. So there I sat in that yellow school bus, Eric Fisher's younger brother, eclipse boy, visually impaired and totally incapable of following in his brother's footsteps. The scene faded. I stood still for another minute, trying to remember more, but nothing would come. Then I made myself turn away from the wall, and it, I made my legs move again, one step in front of the other, to the end of the street. As I turned the corner, I was surprised to see other kids standing next to the guardhouse. In my two weeks here, I had never seen any other kid in Lake Windsor Downs, even though I had ridden my bike up and down all the streets at all times of the day. Now here they were, spread out in a lazy line, about ten kids of various sizes. I quietly took my place at the end of the line next to a guy who was slouching so badly that I thought he might actually fall over. He wasn't alone either. Everyone seemed to be depressed, to be sorry to be there. I wondered if that was just an act or if they really didn't feel any excitement about the first day of school. What's up, goalie? I turned, startled to find that someone was standing right behind me. I hadn't seen him coming. It was Joey Costello. I held out my hand and said, It's Paul. Paul Fisher. You're Joey, right? Right, he answered, shaking my hand. I met your brother over at my house. I met your father, too. Yeah, they said something about that. They said your brother can kick 50-yard field goals. Right, yeah, he can. Mike says Coach Warner has him holding the ball for him. His name's Eric, right? Yeah, I had a feeling Mike would be holding the ball for Eric when he told us he was the backup quarterback. Joey thought for a moment and said, Mike's getting a bad break, you know. Mike's a good player, but he's a line man. 
not a quarterback, and now he's playing behind Antoine Thomas, the best quarterback in the state. He'll never get to play unless something bad happens to Antoine, and then everybody will be mad because Mike ain't no Antoine. Yeah, he can't win. The bus turned into the entranceway and stopped in front of us. When we climbed on, Joey sat with one of the soccer players from the other day. I found an empty seat near the back and pulled out my class schedule. The school had sent us a computerized schedule that showed my six periods, teachers' names, and classroom numbers. With the schedule had come a map of the high school, middle school campus, which I appreciated, and a handwritten note to mom from Mrs. Gates, which I did not. It said, vision-impaired students should report to the office for assistance. That made me mad. What did she plan to do? Assign me a dog and a cane? The bus turned into the campus and drove around to a circular driveway that said, buses only. I looked again at my schedule, feeling jittery, and said, homeroom, 8.15 to 8.25, portable 9. I moved along with a big crowd of kids circling the main building and funneling into the wooden walkways that led to the portables. I found the one that said P9 with no problem whatsoever. There was a green sign on the door that said Miss Alvarez. I climbed the three wooden stairs and opened the door. Miss Alvarez gave me a cheery good morning and told me to find an empty desk. The class seems to be made up of the same type of droopy kids that had stood with me in the bus line. On contrast, Miss Alvarez had a lot of enthusiasm. She told us that she was truly excited to be here on the first day of a new year. She went on to tell us that we're, that we're her first homeroom ever and that she's looking forward to starting each day with us. We sat there and stared at her without much reaction, but she smiled bravely th through it, and we passed the first 10 minutes of the school year together. She asked us to all take out our schedules and check them. Mine said Science 830 to 925, Portable 12. Miss Alvarez read some announcements from a computer printout, but there was nothing about the soccer team. The speaker in the room crackled to life with the sound of a going of a gong being struck. This was our signal to funnel out again onto the wooden walkways. We had four minutes to get to our next class, but it took me less than one. I climbed up a set of stairs marked P twelve, where the green sign said Mrs. Hoffman. Mrs. Hoffman was standing right inside the door, scowling and holding a seating chart. She's clearly at the under, other end of the teacher food chain from Miss Alvarez. As she would soon tell us, she has been teaching science for 20 years. She asked my name and then directed me to the last seat in the first row. The kids in the room seemed a little more lively. Just five minutes into Mrs. Hoffman's class, there was a knock on the door. A girl came in holding a block of wood with the word pass painted on it, she whispered to Miss, Mrs. Hoffman, who checked her chart, looked toward me, and said, Paul Fisher, go with this late young lady, please. What could I do? I got up. I followed the girl out the door and into the hall walkway. I said, where are we going? Mr. Murrow's office. Who's Mr. Murrow? He's the head of guidance. We went to a small office inside the main office. A man with a brown suit and thick glasses like mine was sitting at a desk. He had a pile of those IEP forms spread out in front of him. He said, and what is your name? Paul Fisher, sir. He found my IEP form. All right, Paul, this is Carrie Gardner, one of our school volunteers. Carrie will act as your eyes, so to speak, until you've learned your way around our campus. I can see fine. She, he seemed genuinely surprised. You can? Yes, sir. I've been to two classes already. Mr. Moore looked back at my IEP form and then at me. He said, well, perhaps since you're new to our school, Carrie could just take you around for the first day. What harm could that do? I don't know what else to say. I didn't know how to describe the harm that would do to, that would do to me. Nothing more came out of my mouth. So she, he said, why don't you go, you two go on back to Mrs. Hoffman's class. I found Carrie Gardner back Followed Carrie Gardner back to B12, actually to the wooden steps outside of it. That was where I finally found my voice. I stopped still and said as calmly as I could, Look, I'm sorry, I don't mean to mess up your job, but there's no reason for anybody to show me around, okay? She looked at me puzzled, so I explained, There's nothing wrong with me. This is a mistake. I can see just fine. Carrie answered matter-of-factly, So then what's with the glasses? I reached up and fingered the thick plastic frames. I finally answered. I had an accident. I had some kind of damage to my eyes when I was five years old. 
Carrie clearly did not mind being released from her duties. She looked for a moment, lowered her voice, and said, Look, I'll hold on to the past until the end of the day and then turn it in. Nobody will know. Okay, thanks. Carrie started off but turned back to ask, What was the accident? What damaged your eyes? I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure, I replied. She took off again, leaving me thinking, why didn't I answer that question? I used to have an answer ready to that question, but I used to tell people that I once stared too long at a solar eclipse. But if that's the truth, if that really happened, why can't I remember it? Wednesday, August 30th. I am in my room now at the computer, listening to the sound of air kicking a football into a net in the backyard. It's a short, violent sound, like some big guys holding up some little guy and punching him over and over in the stomach. Poomph, poomph, poomph. The Eric Fisher football dream seems to be materializing. Arthur Bear is holding the ball for him today, crouching low and spinning the laces away just like Dad, just like Mike Costello. Arthur is a senior like Eric. Unlike Eric, he seems to have no special talent for football, and yet here he is, a third string bench warmer kind of guy, Holding the ball for the great Eric Fisher. Arthur has a sister named Paige, who is a sophomore and a cheerleader. Paige is down there, too. She is clearly going to be Eric's girlfriend. Arthur's girlfriend is named Tina Turretin. She's sitting next to Paige. Tina is a junior and, of course, a cheerleader. The four of them are hanging out in the smoke of a late afternoon muck fire ignited by an early afternoon lightning strike. Pump, pump, pump. Mom has already done her research on Eric's friends. She pumps him for information over dinner every night, and she tells, he tells her whatever she wants to know. Arthur and Paige Bear are the yellow steward with the brick front. Their father is a building contractor and major in the Army National Guard. They moved in three years ago. Tina Turretin is the white York. Like ours, but with about avocado trim. She's only lived here a year. There's a strange foursome sitting back there in the smoke. Basically, they pay no attention to each other. The girls are on the cement patio, sitting at the redwood picnic table during homework. Doing homework. The girl, the boys, are on the grass, kicking the ball into the net. Poom, poom, poom. I guess Paige and Tina want to date football players, so those two will do. Eric and Arthur want to date cheerleaders, so those two will do. I watched them all pull up to the house in Arthur Bayer's truck. Then I hurried upstairs. Arthur has a white Toyota Land Cruiser that he's jacked up and put big tires on for mud running. That's what they do around here. They take their jacked up cars out into, jacked up trucks out into the swamps and mud run. When they can't do that, they run up and down the dirt road behind our wall, the perimeter road. Arthur's truck has a big spotlight mounted on top at the center of the windshield so he can go mud running at night. Now he can take Eric mud running, and he can take Eric to practice, and he can take Eric wherever else Eric says to take him. You see, Eric doesn't drive. Can you believe that? One of the greatest things about high school is that you can drive all by yourself. You're free. But Eric doesn't drive. He has never even expressed an interest in driving. Tell me that isn't strange. From my bedroom window, I can see them all clearly, especially Arthur Bear, Bear, and I can predict his future. Arthur is about to get his big break, his chance to be somebody at Lake Windsor High. Let's face it, Arthur Bear is no Mike Costello. He is not the backup quarterback to Antoine Thomas. He has not already been accepted into FSU's School of Engineering. He has never really accomplished anything until now. This is his shot at the big time. He will somehow, with Eric's help, beat out Mike Costello for the job of holder on place kicks. It will be Arthur's backside featured in the newspapers holding the ball for Eric Fisher's 50-yard field goal attempts. According to Joey Costello, Arthur has never even gotten into a game. Now he'll be out there with the crowd when the crowd is roaring and the cameras are flashing and the game is on the line. What will Arthur do for an opportunity like that? For that kind of fame and glory, what will Arthur do for Eric, his sponsor, his benefactor, his ticket to the big time? Let's face it, he will do anything. He will do anything that Eric asks. He has found himself a place in the Eric Fisher football dream, and he will do anything to stay there. 
I've always been afraid of Eric. Now I get to be afraid of Eric and Arthur. 